Hola, què tal? Bona tarda a tothom. És un gust veure com es fan actes culturals. A més, està tot venut. Avui espero que sigui interessant, sobretot, escoltar a la Copano Matloa. És una de les veus més importants de la literatura. Anava a dir africana, però no. Mundial. Porta una carrera fulgurant. Deu anys escrivint llibres que són joies. Jo quan llegia a la Copano a Sud-àfrica va coincidir que ella va començar a ser una estrella de la literatura quan jo justament vaig arribar. Jo vaig estar vivint sis anys i mig a Johannesburg, treballant com a corresponsal de La Vanguardia. I just una de les experiències més maques que jo vaig viure allà va ser amb l'Amtí i el Mopite, dos amics meus, que em van convidar a ser a anar a la seva boda, a la seva cerimònia, però em van convidar a ser un dels negociadors de l'equip de negociadors de la Lobola. La Lobola és una mena de dot tradicional, un pagament, entre cometes, de vaques o diners, que es dona a la família de la dona. A mi em va costar al principi, però ho recordo, després d'anar al sud de Sud-àfrica a fer aquest tràmit, aquesta tradició, vam celebrar la cerimònia. La Mopite i l'Emtí són segurament un dels exemples d'aquesta nova generació nascuda lliure després de l'apartheid que havien triomfat. L'Amtí, una noia que havia estudiat empresarials, treballava en banc. El meu pit era d'un context bastant més pobre, de Soweto, però tenia una feina fixa amb un sou. Era un noi considerat d'èxit al seu barri, un barri molt pobre. Recordo aquesta celebració, aquesta cerimònia, havien muntat una carpa molt gran perquè hi havia molts convidats, i entrar, mirar els voltants i veure que jo era l'únic blanc. I allò no em va quadrar, perquè vaig dir, si és una noia que ha estudiat a la universitat, si és un noi que ja es mou ara pel centre on hi ha més blancs, com és això? I vaig trobar moltes respostes als llibres de la Copano. O sigui, tant de les desigualtats socials que podem trobar a Coconut, em sembla que en castellà no és de Coco, com les ferides més profundes del que va ser l'apartheid, com la xenofòbia, la pobresa, l'odi, les supersticions de fluorescència o del seu altre llibre, La Lletge de Ramada, que no sé, em sembla que en català es traduirà d'un altre nom, Aigua... Aigua passada, sí. Ho sospitava perquè ho vaig veure ahir per Twitter. La Copano té una cosa també molt interessant, que és que té una mirada diferent, perquè el seu perfil també ho és. És una noia molt jove, nascuda en 1984, però també és una noia que és llicenciada en medicina, exerceix la medicina, va estudiar també una mena de màster, una a veure si ho dic bé, un màster en ciències de la medicina global a la Universitat d'Oxford. Li han donat els premis més importants, el Premi Literari de la Unió Europea o el Gol Sollinca de Literatura Africana. Però és una noia que aporta una visió amb una prosa molt intel·ligent, una mirada atrevida de la situació que està vivint a Sud-àfrica actualment. Una mirada lluny de l'adolcorament amb el que habitualment es parla de Sud-àfrica, com la nació de l'art de Sant Martí, la nació del futur que hem parlat. Nosaltres ara la podem llegir gràcies en castellà a Alfadecà i en català a Sembra Llibres. I aquest debat, més que debat serà una entrevista, que parli ella, que és la interessant, forma part de les activitats organitzades, em sentiu bé, del CCB en paral·lel a l'exposició de l'artista sud-africà Willan Cantridge, el que no està dibuixat, la teniu aquí al costat. Us aconsello molt, molt que l'aneu a veure. Dins del programa, la cicatriu colonial. Doncs la Copano, crec que em sent, crec que està a Pretòria. I don't know if you are hearing me, Copano. Very nice meeting you again. How is everything there? Me. Okay, are you in Pretoria? Can you hear me okay? Yes, now? Yes, I am. Yeah, okay. So everything nicer in South Africa? Yes, yeah. No, um, yeah, as good as it can be during a COVID pandemic. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
But yeah, we are well, trying to stay safe. Okay, we'll talk about this uh, pandemic in South Africa. You know, it's the most affected country in Africa. But let's start what, about the things that people say about you. I have read a lot of things about you as a writer. Even here in the, the Catalan book, it says you are the new Chimamanda Ngozi. Uh, people say you are like uh, the new Nadine Gordimer too. But there is a title that it sounds interesting to me, that they say you are the voice of the, born, the free born generation of South Africa. What it means that for you and how do you feel about it? Goodness, it's, um, look, technically I'm not born free, although if I spend too much detail on that, I'll reveal my age, so <laughs> I'll leave it there. Um, look, it's a beautiful compliment, but I, I don't think there could ever be a single um, voice for an entire generation. I think I'm one of many, many, many voices that's attempting to write the what next chapter of South Africa's um, story. I think we had begun to become a little bit defined by our past and that can be a little bit distracting from the opportunity that today presents to us. So for me, it's so exciting to see so many young people um, make their voices heard through various mediums, through the arts, through literature, through fashion, through interior design, um, and it's necessary. We need many voices. There's so much pain and there's so much joy that no single voice can tell it all. No single voice can capture all of that nuance. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if I have to, I'm, I'm watching you here, but I think I have to look there just to see in your eyes. So I remember when I was in, in South Africa doing some interviews uh, with uh, freedom fighters, Catrada, uh, Winnie Mandela, Goldberg, Desmond Tutu, and I ask, always ask them about the South Africa today, this walk to freedom. Uh, and I remember Catrada told me that freedom is not a destination point, it's a way to arrive. I would like to ask you about after 25 years of, of freedom, how is South Africa today? How you will define South Africa and how, how it is for you? Mm. Yeah, look, I mean, I think South Africa is as challenging as anywhere else today, I suppose. You know, I suppose someone sitting in the US might <laughs> be sharing some similar battle scars to us. You know, there's the politics, there's the racial prejudice, there's the white privilege, there's the inequality, there's the gender-based violence um, that we grapple with on a day-to-day -day basis. But there's also just the beauty of ordinary people trying to give their children a better life than they had, young men and women striving hard to reach their dreams and refusing to be defined by race or gender or be limited by unreliable politicians. Mm -hmm. South Africa has gone through a lot of scandals during Zuma, Jacob Zuma um, uh, management. Um, but now you have like a kind of most accepted by the system uh, president, Cyril Ramaphosa. Uh, how is the situation now? Uh, South Africa has improved some way? Yes and no. Um, I think the recent looting of public funds that were supposed to be dedicated to the purchasing of personal protective equipment as part of our response to the COVID-19 pandemic was a stark reminder of just how corruption has absolutely eroded South African society. Um, but credit must be given where credit is due. I think our government's initial response to the pandemic was admirable particularly considering that nobody could have foreseen this kind of global calamity on the horizon and that there were few precedents, um, previous precedents to draw from to give guidance. That said, that unscrupulous opportunists linked to the current political administration use the opportunity to line their pockets um, 
with little regard to the, the lives they were putting in jeopardy, was and is sickening. Um, so I think we're not quite out of the woods just as yet when it comes to good governance in South Africa. Mm -hmm. I hold you in South Africa lift the, this Black Lives Matter movement uh, around the world, but in the United States, because it was like stronger there maybe, but it's also linked with South Africa and South African society. How, how that happened there? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it resonated with a lot of people. I think it opens up old wounds. It's a reminder of just how much work still needs to be done. And I think particularly amongst the, the youth um, in an education system that continues to draw very heavily from colonial ideals and doesn't adequately acknowledge, let alone celebrate, African culture, languages, um, and traditions, um, yeah, I think it resonated strongly um, with South Africans. Mm -hmm. I, I remember when I, when I arrived there, uh, it was like 2009, and everybody was very optimistic. I remember the um, British journalist uh, John Carlin saying that South Africa is a kind of um, miracle, and Finnish miracle on an imperfect uh, miracle, but it was not the only one. I mean, everybody was talking very good about South Africa, even if Mandela was not uh, there anymore. But I don't know if this uh, sweet rhetoric about um, South Africa is doing more harm than good. Do you think that put too much pressure on you or in, as a generation? How, how do you see that? Yeah. Look, I mean, I think often people say it was a miracle because, you know, there's this notion that we escaped a war. But I think that that notion doesn't consider the war that continues um, behind closed doors across households in South Africa on the bodies of South African women. Um, so that micro war continues. I think the liberation generation did an incredible and, import and an important job of seeing us through a precarious transition between apartheid and so-called post-apartheid South Africa. Um, but the hard work of truly achieving equality in South Africa in ways that are not just ceremonious, but in ways that are truly meaningful to people's lives has barely scratched the surface. I mean, we continue to have insanely high levels of income inequality in South Africa, some of the highest in the world, tied tightly to racial lines. Um, black men and women continue to dominate the low paid jobs if they're lucky enough to have a job. Um, most of the wealth in South Africa is disproportionately held in, in the hands of white South Africans. So. 350 years of perverse social engineering is going to require more than miracles. It's going to require intentional policies that are deliberate about undoing those centuries of intergenerational damage as a result of both colonialism and um, apartheid. It's going to require that the segment of our society that benefited from that perverse social engineering truly grapple with that history and commit to be part of the change, not just in words, but in tangible actions. It requires that our political leaders not be preoccupied with self-enrichment, but rather preoccupied with addressing the indignities that South Africans have to live with on a day-to-day -day basis. And it requires a society that believes that change is actually possible. And I don't know if we believe that anymore. Um, and it requires a crap load of hard work. Um, yeah, so no, we still have a very long road to walk. Mm -hmm. Were you during a funeral, the funeral of Nelson Mandela, were you around in South Africa or you were in, in UK? Um, I think I might have been in the UK. I actually can't for the life of me remember. But yeah, I was watching it from TV, um, okay. not sort of intimately involved. Because I remember it was uh, like crazy. Everybody was on the streets dancing and was something very nice that people from 
all the classes, all the contexts, all the races, all the colors were on the streets dancing and, and celebrating Nelson Mandela life. How, how you felt that? I don't know if it was something important for this generation or it was something for remembering just the past. Yeah, look, I mean, I won't presume to speak for others, but if I speak for myself, I think, you know, Mandela and that entire, what I'm calling the liberation generation, as I said, did a very important job. I mean, I think that transition was dicey, to say the least. And, and they were good stewards of seeing us through that. I don't think we should romanticize war. And I'm certainly grateful that my parents and myself didn't need to live through a war. But I think that's just one step in the journey. I think as some have used the metaphor of a house, you know, you build the foundation and it, it was a good foundation, but there's lots of work that needed to be done. The walls, the roof, the plumbing, the tiling, the carpeting. And I think that's the hard work, that there's almost this sort of ceremonious kind of democratic South Africa. But in, in meaningful terms, I mean, you know, some economists argue that um, in the last two decades, um, for black men anyway, they are steeped in greater poverty than they were. You know, so we can't just lull ourselves with the miracle of the rainbow nation. We need to say, yes, there was an incredible transition that was necessary and it happened, but what next? How do we undo 350 years of perverse social engineering that doesn't happen magically, that requires work, and, and it's time now that we put in the work. You are talking about the, this 350 uh, system, mm. uh, not only mm. apartheid, because it started mm. uh, much more before. I'd like to talk about a story, a friend that I, I met. Um, I changed to Catalan to explain that, it will be easier. Uh, as they as Sepo, y era un noida da Soweto, que um, volia ser violonchalista, és violonchalista ara, ara mateix. I recordo, jo el vaig conèixer en el moment en què ella estava practicant, és un, un, un gran amic, i ella estava practicant per passar uns, uns exàmens per entrar a la filharmònica de Johannesburg. I hi havia una certa polèmica perquè ell, per ser negre, tenia un, una puntuació millor d'entrada que els seus rivals eh, noies, en aquest cas, que eren, eren blanques. I vaig estar parlant, anava sovint a, a casa seva i, i, i discutint sobre aquesta situació i recordo que un moment que ja em diu és que si estem parlant de justícia, però jo li diria, ostres, doncs si això no és massa just des del principi, no? Però si estem parlant de justícia, parlem de tot. Perquè jo he après, a, a, ho he practicat, he après a tocar el violoncello amb una escombra i, he, i aquesta gent que està competint contra mi amb un professor particular a casa seva, però no només és una qüestió de diners, és que a casa meva jo vaig ser el primer de la meva família que va saber qui era Mozart i qui era Beethoven. I estic competint amb algú. Do you, do you have this, this feeling that uh, this generation is uh, with all these handicaps, is this historical inequality, we could say, is present in your life, and in which ways is that present in your skin? Yeah, sure. I mean, yeah, as I said, it, it continues. Um, I mean, you know, you know, it's just fact that black South Africans live in worse health and in greater poverty than white South Africans. Um, black South Africans continue to be structurally excluded from the country's economy. Economists estimate that 20% of the population hold 70% of income in South Africa. And of course, that 20% is largely white. Um, youth unemployment is well above 50%. And of course, the majority of unemployed youth in South Africa are, are Blacks. Um, so I agree 100% with, with Tapo that for him to be standing there um, playing the violin or the cello or whatever it was, with all the odds having been stacked against him since birth, I mean, that's a tremendous victory. And that needs to be acknowledged. And the acknowledgement of that is justice. 
um, the, the lack of acknowledgement of what needs to be overcome by a young black South African to get to that examination is injustice. So I don't think there's anything unfair about um, what he experienced. Mm -hmm. I have to say, I have to add that Seppo is currently in the, in a, the Philharmonic of Berlin. So okay. his success on, on that. And <laughs> yeah, it was, it's a very nice story because the cello is a big, big uh, um, mm. instrument. And he had to walk with this big instrument to the center of Johannesburg to play on the street mm. to get some money to wow. pay the, the classes. So his story and the, the amazing thing is not an isolated story in South Africa. Mm. A lot of mm. young black people uh, had to overcome this uh, inequality on, on their lives. That's something interesting in your books, is that in all of them, you are very uh, critical voice referring to South Africa as a society. But in terms of the youth, the, the characters of the books, they are always strong, they are um, intelligent, and they are committed. So what about this generation, this youth generation, the positive vibes that you have about them. Are you optimistic about this youth generation? Even if it's not fair, even if it's, it's the inequality, is it still there? But what about the society, the, the youth people in South Africa? Yeah. No, I'm incredibly optimistic, incredibly. Um, I am so inspired by the many, many, many young men and women who are shattering all sorts of glass ceilings in industry and in business and in sports and in arts and in music. They inspire me. And unfortunately, those kind of stories don't always make the headlines. You know, you know one can be sort of consumed and overwhelmed with the negative news. But there's so much good. There's a lot of resilience and a lot of promise amongst young South Africans of all races. Mm -hmm. And also, I, I would like to talk also about your um, career as a writer. I, Coconut, Coconut, for example, was published in 2007, a lot of time ago, but it, it arrived, in, arrived in Spain recently, like I think one year or, or two years. Uh, how your voice has changed and how do you see or how do you feel that the Spanish people's Spanish readers are reading your voice of this year, how, how things are changed? Mm. So in terms of how my voice has changed, I think I've matured a little bit as a writer. I've grown a bit. I think I'm more confident in my voice than I was when I was 21. But sure, I will always remain eternally grateful to the 21-year-old Gobano who had the courage um, to put um, words to paper and gave me um, the opportunities and access to worlds that I enjoy today, to access to people like yourselves that I could have never um, dreamed of. So she inspires me. Um, I, and I try to make her proud by striving to stay true to the ideals that motivated her um, all those many years ago. Mm -hmm. No, no he dit abans, eh, però que sapigueu al final, o oh, dintre d'una uns minuts, obrirem la veu perquè pugueu fer preguntes tant aquí com a la gent que ens està seguint en streaming. Jo us convido moltíssim a que a que pregunteu les dubtes que tingueu, del que vulgueu, de Sudàfrica, de de escriptura o de de també de l'altra part que defineix a la Copano, que és la seva feina com a metge i el seu compromís social. That's something I would like that you explain. Because you are a doctor, but you also um, are the founder of a social organization linked with, uh, with uh, medicine. Could you explain this part of you and how that affects your writing? Yeah, um, so I, I'm fortunate to have two loves. Um, I always quote Chekhov who said, medicine is his wife and writing is his mistress. And I can definitely relate to that. Um, I think my work in public health um, gives me an opportunity to grapple with issues that are very important to me. And my writing helps me to unpack for myself the whys behind the whys. So 
it's two very different worlds, but it's two worlds that um, enrich me. And um, yeah, and I'm also a very undisciplined writer. I can go for many months without writing, and then I can go for periods where I write obsessively, almost deliriously, where it's all I think and dream about, but it's not a very sustainable way to eke out a livelihood. So I am very grateful that I, I have a day job that I love. Mm -hmm. um, also, I would like to explain um, a story that happened to me the first days actually that I was in South Africa. Un dels primers dies que jo estava a Sud-àfrica, em sembla que dos o tres setmanes d'arribar, recordo que estava en un, en un taxi anant pel, pel carrer i va creuar, va parar i va creuar una noia molt maca per davant i el taxista va dir, ostres, quina noia més guapa, la violaria ara mateix. I jo recordo la sorpresa que em va, em va impactar molt en aquell moment. Temps després, amb amics, eh, estava amb amics de Soweto i a dintre de la conversa, una conversa eh, informal, hi havia un noi que deia que, bueno, pues que esa, ai, li agradaven tant les noies que a vegades quan es posava a veure es tornava una mica violent. I els altres, d'alguna manera, reien del que estava dient, com dient, va, vaja, vaja, quin tio, quin tio més, més bèstia ets? O... I recordo l'impacte que em va provocar. I a gent eh, fluorescència, eh, period pain, vaig tenir aquesta sensació de, de que la violència contra les dones, hi ha un moment de la història que hi ha una violència directa contra el protagonista molt, molt gran, que la violència contra les dones era una cosa que no estava superada. Tu abans has parlat d'una, em sembla que has dit, una microguerra dintre, dintre de la situació de Sud-àfrica. Com veus aquest aspecte? Perquè és un aspecte més que tractes molt en els teus llibres, la, el masclisme, però també una violència que jo parlaria més gran. O sigui, Sud-àfrica és un dels països amb una ràtio de, de violacions per dia més grans del món, més de 150 al dia, és una, és una barbaritat. Com veus que Sud-àfrica està mm, lidiant amb aquesta miniguerra que li deies abans de la, de la violència sexual? Yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right, Xavier. I mean, it's no secret that South Africa struggles with what some call the shadow pandemic of gender-based violence that disproportionately affects women and children. And it's awful. I mean, it's really difficult to know what to say about it, really. Um, is it getting better or worse? Um, I mean, I think that... Of late, um, there's been acknowledgement at the highest level of political office that this is a, a matter of national concern, is um, a step in the right direction, a small step, a tiny step, but a step nonetheless. Um, mind you, that those kind of acknowledgements didn't happen because men suddenly woke up and thought, my goodness, what we're doing is horrible. Um, they happened because women said enough is enough. Uh, women came together and insisted that our political leaders listen and do something. And, you know, of course, all of this is linked to patriarchy and all of this is linked to income inequality and poverty. And so it's all connected. And that's why I said there's a lot of hard work we still need to do as a nation. There no quick fixes, no silver bullets, no shortcuts. It's enough with the miracles. Um, we need to start doing the hard work of finding sustainable, long-term solutions to South Africa's social ills. Mm -hmm. Hi havia una, una situació especialment, bueno, horrible, no sé si especialment horrible, perquè tot això del que hem parlat és una situació molt, molt horrible, però que eren les violacions positives, les eh, positive rapes, I think they, they told them, que és que es juntava la violència contra les dones contra la violència contra els col·lectius homosexuals. Es violaven alguns sectors a les noies lesbianes per, d'aquesta manera, convèncer-les de tornar a ser heterosexuals amb mentalitat de, del violador. Recordo estar amb una d'aquestes noies que l'havien la, violat i l'havia violat el seu veí. 
I la resposta del seu context, de la seva família, va ser demanar-li que es casés amb el violador, perquè era una manera de parar la vergonya, era una noia més que s'havia quedat embarassada. Com veus aquesta situació en què dues de les xacres d'una societat patriarcal com les violacions contra les dones i la manca de respecte brutal contra l'homosexualitat passen a Sud-àfrica. Sud-àfrica té una de les constitucions més progressistes del món, però hi ha alguna cosa que no acaba de colar bé en aquest odi cap a la dona, odi cap al diferent, a l'homosexual, i aquestes lleis tan progressistes. Sí, no, vull dir, és com dius, és horrible i, certament, un estén a la nostra societat. I, vull dir, el que puc dir és que hem de arribar a les raons, saps? Jo crec que és fàcil de parlar de això superficialment, però per què està passant? I crec que hi ha altres que poden parlar d'això amb molta més sofisticació i experiència que jo puc, But certainly, you know, addressing the, the root ills in our society related to patriarchy, related to income inequality, to re related to prejudice. And then also creating meaningful opportunities for women, you know, so that, that they are less vulnerable because they're able to stand on their own two feet. Um, I think what's encouraging is that it's certainly in the open now. You know, I think it's not something that's Um, swept under the carpet. It's something that is spoken about widely. Um, and I think that is the first step in the right direction, that we acknowledge as a society that we have this problem. And then what next? How do we address it? Copano, mm -hmm. I would like to ask you about how, you, how do you see us? How do you see Europe? We could also add maybe United States. In South African history, you know about headdress, you know about racism. And that something is growing in Europe. We have the right-wing parties growing in Europe. In Spain, we have Vox, that like the extremist uh, right-wing, but also the right-wing um, parties are going to this, or, or buying this, um, and es, comprando ese discurso de la, de la derecha. Also in the United States, we see that the extremist groups are growing, even attacking the capital, as we saw recently. How, you, how do you see us and what you will say to us after the experience that you have in your country? Yeah, so I mean, I think um, populism is populist leaders who sort of push for these extremist views seems to be on the rise globally, um, and it is a scary phenomena, um, which seems to be in part fueled by misinformation through social media. So I think we're in um, a frightening era of being in bubbles of information that speak to whatever biases we have. But I think, you know, the spirit of humanity, um, and I suppose maybe that's one thing that I'm, I'm proud of as a South African, is that You know, if people decide that this, um, these extremist views are not them, you know, regardless of whether the person perpetuating them is of the same skin color or the same gender or from the same community or even the same religious groups, then, you know, my, one of my favorite quotes is that don't underestimate what a small group of committed citizens um, can do to change the world. In fact, It's, I'm, I'm butchering it, but in fact, it's always been a small group of committed, committed citizens that changed the world. And I think we mustn't forget that it can be very overwhelming to see the rise of all sorts of um, extreme views against certain races or foreigners, xenophobia, against certain genders, against certain religious groups. But goodness prevails. I mean, I think I certainly believe in, in goodness. And I, and I think it's about us not being couch commentators, um, because we can get comfortable, you know, tweeting our thoughts, but actually in our own little communities, in our own corners, at dinner tables, you know, pushing back against extremist views, even in our own families, and being courageous enough to call it out when it happens in our own circles. I think that's the beginning of pushing back against this frightening tide of 
yeah, dangerous um, populist leaders with um, perverse agendas. Mm -hmm. At the beginning, I told, uh, I told you, I told uh, all of you that South, uh, South Africa is the most affected country uh, by COVID uh, pandemic. Actually, I checked the numbers, uh, the figures this morning is 1.4 million of positives and 37,000 dead people. Just to compare, Spain is a bit more of 2 million and 53,000 uh, dead people. So uh, I, it's, the, the figures are, are not similar, but, but close by. Uh, what is, uh, how is South Africa suffering this, this pandemic in the health part and in the economic part? Yeah, so the initial response was admirable, I think, but we are now in the throes of the second wave and there's been a lot of scrambling, um, which is worrying because one would have thought that um, the lessons learned from the first wave would have been used to strengthen our health system against um, subsequent storms. Um, there's talk of a vaccine on the horizon, but mass vaccinations haven't begun as yet. So it's a difficult time. I mean, I think particularly because we had um, a fragile health system as it is. I mean, we grapple with high levels of HIV, high levels of trauma related to violence and drunken driving, high levels of non-communicable diseases, so diabetes and hypertension and heart disease. So we're already a country that's grappling with quite a lot. So this on top of that is devastating. We're losing healthcare workers, we're losing teachers. Um, schools on Friday have been postponed yet again. And, uh, and you know, for many South Africans, they don't ha have, we don't have the luxury of alternative forms of childcare. So there's a lot as a country we're trying to navigate, um, and it's difficult. I mean, you know, we're sort of in the eye of the storm, and all I can say is that it's difficult, but we will get through it. We are a resilient people. Um, we've been through a lot, um, and we will get through this, and hopefully we come out on the other side stronger. And how do you see it? The other day I was uh, checking news, and, and I saw that they said 95% of the vaccines, the 95% of the last vaccines, uh, they were grabbed by 15%, 14% of the population. Uh, logically, that means uh, that means that South Af that Africa, the continent, is like uh, dejado aparte, igual que los diferentes países, uh, otros diferentes países con menos recursos. ¿Cómo ves esa desigual distribución de medicinas? Eh, más allá de la, de la cuestión a lo mejor injusta, a lo mejor también hay algún concepto de pues hay otras enfermedades o unos recursos que se deciden invertir en, otros, en otras enfermedades, como pueden ser la malaria, como puede ser el VIH, que Sudáfrica es el país con más eh, enfermos de, de VIH. Eh, ¿cómo, ¿Cómo ves esa distribución tan, tan desigual en la que unos pocos, un 14%, se quedan prácticamente todas las vacunas? Mm. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, it's unfair, you know, it's, it's terrible, but it's also short-sighted. I think we're a lot more connected than we think, and I think we can't, as nations, think we can secure ourselves in bubbles and we'll be unaffected by um, countries elsewhere um, struggling. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's very short-sighted in terms of um, wealthy nations. I mean, there are some encouraging signs from nations that have procured more than what they need and plan to distribute that. But I also think that here at home, I think, you know, there are resources sometimes um, that could be better allocated and more efficiently used. I mean, we have a failing airline that's um, recently, or there are plans to bail it out with billions of money. So I think there's both the global sort of um, recognizing globally that we are a connected world and it is a short-term and short-sighted solution to think that you can do something for your little corner and that you won't be affected by chaos elsewhere. But I think if I speak about mm -hmm. South Africa, I think that our government can be much more efficient in terms of the use of public resources and that this is a, an important lesson 
around how we prioritize resources in South Africa. Sorry, mm -hmm. my son has stepped into this. <laughs> Hello, how are you? <laughs> We're talking from Barcelona. <laughs> Does he want to participate on the debate? <laughs> no, it's bedtime, so. Uh, okay. <laughs> What's his name? <laughs> What's his name? His name is Lovane. It's bedtime, Levane. so you know there's always tricks and antics at, at okay. this time of night. <laughs> let me let continue about your work as a doctor. Uh, we'll try to do shorter because you have to do <laughs> to uh, bring him to to the bed. So as a doctor, you, you see the impact of um, this pandemic not only in people with, that is uh, affected by, by COVID, it's also affected in other parts, so other uh, problems. How do you see this situation? How is it affecting the general health system in South Africa? Because your, your exp uh, specialization is not COVID, it's other uh, part of, of the medicine. How, how is affecting your work? Yeah, so I work in public health, specifically in child malnutrition. Um, and as a result of mass job losses um, and greater income insecurity, we are seeing that many more families are becoming vulnerable to income insecurity and poverty. And that, of course, casts a shadow on the well-being of children because malnutrition affects children both cognitively in terms of brain development, in terms of the immune systems, but also economically, that children who are malnourished, you know, do worse in school, are less likely to find jobs. So what we've been preoccupied with is trying to minimize as much as possible the inevitable setbacks. But, you know, they also say never waste a crisis. And so... COVID has really illuminated just how the gaps in our social um, security um, programs. And so what we are trying to do is to advocate for policies that are long overdue, that have been talked about and planned and half written, really advocating for those policies that um, should be protecting the most vulnerable, particularly women and children, really push through during this time so that we are better buffered against subsequent storms. Before uh, passing the, the, the microphone to the, to the public for the questions, I would like to end with uh, writers. Uh, if you can suggest some writers. In South Africa, we have uh, Coetze, we have Nadine Gordimen, Wally Cerote. In the rest of the continent, Chimamanda, as I said before, Soyinka, we have uh, Achebe. But what about the new voices? In, in Zimbabwe, we have non-violet Bulawayo, for example, that's a, a very refreshing voice. But what about these new voices in South Africa or in the rest of the continent? Here, people that, people that came here, uh, it's interested about you, about your uh, writing. Uh, I would like you to take the opportunity to suggest other writers, other voices that we have to follow the next years? Yeah, sure. You're putting me on the spot there, Xavier. <laughs> I'm <laughs> terrible. With the names of writers, I always remember how a book makes me feel and, um, and seldom who wrote it. I'm kind of sort of non-particular um, when, it, when it comes to that. But I would say there are a lot of exciting young people coming through. So you've mentioned Novale Bulawayo, who's incredible, and I... Mm -hmm. I love her work. Um, I mean, I'm also quite an old soul that I often go back to, you know, Chinera Cheva, I go back to Tizi Dangaremba, I go back to Toni Morrison. So I go back to my creature comfort writers, particularly in these kind of difficult times. So the writers that held me when I was a teenager and struggling to figure my, my own self out. Um, so I am very much reading in a very sort of insular way right now. But I would, yeah, recommend to be out there on social media. There's some exciting publishing houses, I would say, who publish fantastic writers. So Pontus, right there <laughs> in um, Barcelona, produces some incredible work across the continent. So to look up what they have. And then in South Africa, Jakarta Media is published me, took a bet on me. Um, so looking at the writers that are coming up through them is a great place to start. 
Mm -hmm. how, is, how is your writing system? You say before that sometimes you write uh, a lot, sometimes you don't write, but do you choose the same place to write? Do you choose, uh, what's the atmosphere that you need to, to write? Yeah, um, no, no, no specific place or pair. I know some writers have a pair of pants that they put on. Um, I don't have anything like that. I sometimes have a, a, a soundtrack that, you know, a particular um, song that comes to me that gets me right into the, the emotion that I want to be in. Um, but the same song uh, all the time? Same song. No, not for all the books, but for particular books. So often a book has a song. Okay. Um, um, yeah, and then I, you know, I try not to edit while I'm writing. So I kind of will spend a good couple of months, even years, just throwing all the scraps. I mean, I have folders of scraps that sometimes don't even make it into the book. And sometimes they come back later to subsequent books and just, yeah, for, sorry to be crude, but to really just vomit it all on a page, for lack of a better way of saying it. And then there's a time when you have enough of that, where you see something start to come together and you feel like, goodness, this is, this is a story now. These characters are taking shape and form and have personalities of their own. And that's when the hard work begins because all the scraps is just the, the musings that, that happen from time to time. Um, but it's also evolved. I think with Coconut, I didn't know I was writing. You know, I, I was a medical student. I was messing around, um, you know, in journals and notepads. Um, with Spilt Milk and Period Pain, it was harder because I knew there was a potential audience. And when that happens, you kind of try not to self-censor. Um, yeah, so it's, it's not a very scientific process. Um, and I take it as it comes. Mm -hmm. And Copano, Copano, can you tell us what are you doing? I don't know if you are preparing a new book, something that you can tell us uh, today. Um, I'm writing all the time, all sorts of scraps. I don't know yet if it'll amount to anything worth sharing with my agents or a publisher. Um, but yeah, hopefully soon. I mean, I, I do enjoy writing and I en and, and enjoy the feedback, you know, and kind of seeing how a book comes to life through the eyes and minds and imaginations of others. So, um, <laughs> yeah, um, let me just put them on my lap and then I can focus. <laughs> That's amazed me because, I mean, being a doctor, being a mother, being a writer is not an easy <laughs> An easy thing. I don't know how you deal with that, but it's, I'm sure it's, it's uh, difficult. <laughs> it is challenging, but they definitely keep your feet firmly on the ground. <laughs> Hi, how are you? Well, I think we can pass the, the word to the, to the public, maybe if they have some, some questions. We also have some maybe um, questions from the, the people who is connected the, digitally. So I see some uh, hands. Uh, I think they passed the microphone. I understand that she she hears them directly. Creo que sí, no? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much for uh, making this talk and uh, making it um, like allowing us to be here, like really, because it's it's very unusual these days. And thank you so much, Copano, for, for sharing this time with us. Um, I visited South Africa, I think it was three years ago, and one of the things that amazed us the most uh, was <coughs> the situation of the townships. Uh, like, we visited Cape Town, so I don't know uh, about Pretoria, Johannesburg, or other big cities in, in, in South Africa, but um, that situation was like really a shock for us because here we have townships but they are not that big and um, well, yeah, it's a very challenging situation. And um, we talked with an activist from the townships and uh, he told us that uh, sometimes being born in a township is even a challenge because like getting a job if you come from a township sometimes is, is very hard or maybe uh, having access to education. 
And uh, they were doing a great job in the um, Upper Height Museum about this um, inclusion of the townships uh, in the city. And I wanted uh, to ask you as a doctor, what is this, the current situation with townships and, um, and uh, access to, to kind of solutions to COVID? And uh, if there are any, um, I don't know how to ask, uh, like... Pots dir-ho en català, si vols, eh? Et traduiran. No, el problema no són les idees. Va, va. És com dir-ho. Like, what are the solutions that are being implemented to access all these people? And thank you so much again. Thank you. Thank you so much for that question. And thank you for being here. It's such a privilege to be able to connect with all of you. Um, yeah, I mean, you've, you've hit on one of South Africa's biggest challenges, which is um, land, really. I mean, I think it's a hot political potato right now, is that it's one of those steps that we didn't quite correct. Um, so, as you know, many people were displaced from their land um, as part of a bad date, and it's a long overdue project to restore the land of people, because what land is wealth. And South Africans, Black South Africans, are cramped up in um, highly dense areas where um, there's many people living in, um, you know, shacks, basically. So, so houses, I mean, houses is not even a word to call them, uh, made out of corrugated iron, um, very vulnerable to the elements. So there was recently um, a fire in a township in the Western Cape that devastated families in the middle of a COVID pandemic, you know, as if we needed... Um, another storm in the middle of one. So it is a massive issue. And I think it's one that the current administration has taken huge flack over, you know, that if you're serious about equality, and that's why I said that, you know, we, we talk about the new democratic South Africa and rainbow nation and kumbaya, happy people, but really these things need to happen in ways that are meaningful. You know, it's, it's unjust that a small minority of the population enjoy, um, you know, the, the best parts of the country and the majority are living like sardines and tins, basically. Um, and so I think there has been recent talk of that being addressed. Of course, there's huge resistance because land is a big part of South Africans' wealth and it has to be done in a way that doesn't destabilize the economy. But adequate housing for South Africans remains a massive issue and has, in fact, exasperated the COVID-19 pandemic. So, you know, talk about self-isolation when you're living in cramped quarters with eight people with no access to water. It also undermines all the other things we do. You know, so we, we have feeding programs, but it doesn't help to have a school feeding program when children can't. Um, adequately relieve themselves with good sanitation or they can't wash their hands because they keep getting repeated bouts of diarrhea that mean that they don't retain the nutrients of that food. Um, children can't, you know, you can fund education, but if you're living in quarters where you can't study, where you don't have good lighting, um, you're not going to excel. Um, we can talk about addressing gender-based violence, but if you're in um, quarters that you as a young woman can't have privacy when you dress, that of course makes you even more vulnerable. So, you know, you've really hit on, you know, when I say we have hard work to do, there's some really tangible structural issues around the education system, around jobs, around um, patriarchy, around land, that if we don't begin addressing those, we're, we're going to have this kind of um, unhappy marriage um, where there's lots of resentment and instability as a result. Um, so, you know, there isn't... Um, I can, all I can say is I agree with you. I think you, you've hit it spot on that we have a massive challenge in this regard. And I think voters are asking for political leaders to be serious about addressing this if they want to keep the votes. Parlant de la, de la situació de la qüestió de la terra, és una de les qüestions que um, a mi també m'han m'han canviat molt la mentalitat a parlar amb la gent perquè hi ha un punt de partida que és molt clar, que és tremendament injust. Van arribar uns pocs blancs, van agafar la terra, li van robar als pobladors en aquell moment, que eren negres. Però recordo una conversa, tinc una molt bona amiga sud-africana blanca, Salome, que ella, la seva família, té una granja, una granja a les afores de Pretòria precisament, una granja molt gran, 
I hi havia una disputa perquè hi havia una part de pobladors dels voltants negres que estaven demanant expropiar directament aquestes terres. O sigui, sobre el paper era una demanda justa. Els seus avantpassats havien robat aquelles terres. Però la Salomé et deia, jo no sé si això va ser així, potser sí, però estic parlant d'una cosa de fa sis o set generacions. I quan van arribar els meus tatatatarabuelos, això era una terra on no hi havia res. Els meus tatatarabuelos, amb aquest sistema injust, però després les següents generacions van construir tot això. I ella se sentia molt malament, perquè per un costat veia la injustícia flagrant d'aquest sistema històric, però per l'altra banda, ella no se sentia responsable des del moment en què ella no ho havia fet. I ella estava disposada fins i tot a fer un sistema més just, però el que estaven demanant l'altra part era treure-li aquestes terres. I ara ha passat a una situació com la nostra. Imagineu-vos que nosaltres, aquí a Barcelona, o on visqueu, us diuen que el vostre tatatatarabuelo va a guanyar uns diners de manera fraudulenta i us ho volen fer pagar vosaltres. L'impacte que té això en les vides actuals és molt gran i no és només una qüestió de justícia, perquè si no seria molt més fàcil. Són vides que es veuen afectades per un sistema històricament injust que no es va solucionar i es va portar fins als dies. I don't know if you want to add something or you want to give your opinion about this, but it's something very disturbing also for the privileged part because they, they feel they, they, they are in a, in a risk situation because the injustice that comes from, from the past. Yeah, look, I mean, you know, I think there's a quote that says, when you have been privileged for very long, equality feels like injustice, you know? Um, I think it's a myth that a country can continue with this level of income inequality and be fine. I think the, the cost of income inequality is very high for everyone. You know, you have to pay for private security. You, if you run a business, there will be strikes over and over again. You can't build high enough walls to keep the, um, the aggrieved out. And so there reaches a point where we need to decide as all of us, including as white South Africans and black South Africans, are we serious about a prosperous South Africa, free and fair South Africa for everyone? And then there are gonna have to be some hard decisions. And I mean, this is certainly not my area of expertise, but economists who work in this area, there are models that can work. You know, I think everybody kind of fear mongers around the Zimbabwe situation. Oh my gosh, we're gonna end up like Zimbabwe, right? And that's quite an extreme situation. There are ways of, um, repatriative justice that do not have to crumble an economy like that the farm owner continues to to run that farm but you know um doesn't necessarily the ownership model changes so that what happens on top of the land doesn't necessarily affect who owns the land or cooperatives and there have actually been you know individuals that have started to create these models themselves who who themselves recognize that I can't hide behind the fact that this happened generations ago. It, you know, for all of us, I mean, even for myself as a Black South African, it was my parents and great-grandparents who suffered, but the legacy continues into generation. So on both sides, we need to say, well, we're here now. How do we find a way to, to build a South Africa that is fair and just for everyone? Because it's costly. I mean, the cost, we have a very tiny tax base. You know, so, you know, even this vaccine situation is an example of how a small proportion of the country has to carry the majority. And that won't change until we address um, income inequality, because without addressing that, education is not going to improve, imp jobs are not going to improve. And so you'll never have the majority of people contributing to the tax base. So it is like, I think, um, I can't remember who this author was who said this, but he said, you know, the transition that we need to go through is like resetting break, broken bones, that that's painful. Like if you've got a broken bone and that needs to be reset, of course it's going to be painful, but you cannot walk on a broken bone. So if you want to walk, if you want to stand up as a nation, those bones need to be reset. 
And I think we keep kicking that can, excuse me, into the future, but we can't avoid it anymore. I mean, we have strikes almost every day in South Africa. It becomes unsafe and unstable and economically unviable to continue in the vein we're going in. And so we do need to address this big white elephant in the room. We have a question from the people in, that is following us uh, from streaming. It says, Copano, m'agradaria saber més sobre el teu projecte recorregut com a activista. Fa un any que estem engegant un projecte de cooperació. Què ens aconselles per ajudar a sensibilitzar més població en un moment en què la informació ens desborda? Sure, that's a tough question. Um, I mean, I can speak to the work that we do. Um, in, 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 so I, I run an organization called Grow Great and we work on chronic malnutrition. So this is malnutrition that begins in pregnancy and continues in the early years of life. And it affects about one in four South Africans. Um, and so we try and change that because it's completely preventable and we have very high levels of malnutrition compared to other developing countries, much higher than countries that have similar sized economies to ours. Um, and so we run a micro um, enterprise, a, a social franchise where women can support other women in pregnancy and after a baby's born whilst earning an income for themselves. We work with healthcare workers. Um, we advocate for policies that can change this in the long term. We have a cash transfer in South Africa for children, but it only begins after the child is born. So a big area, a big policy window of opportunity for us is to extend that into pregnancy. Um, so I would say, you know, we're all passionate about something um, and, we'll, and everything is so interconnected. You know, climate change affects the most vulnerable most severely. Um, you know, it will affect developing countries more severely. It will affect women and children who tend to work in the informal economy more severely. It will put us all vulnerable to more um, global pandemics such as the one we're facing. So I would say, you know, if you are someone who's in this difficult storm, wanting to be part of positive change, find your, find your issue, you know, whether it's animal rights or it's um, the rights of mothers and children, or it's racial justice, and, and, and commit yourself to making a difference in that space. I think there isn't, a, you know, it's all linked, and it's all connected, and I don't think there are silver bullets. I think we have progress as humanity when we all find the combination of our talents and our skill sets and an issue that makes a difference to people's lives, and we dedicate ourselves to making a little bit of a difference in that area. Um, there is a lot of misinformation, but fortunately, I think we're becoming increasingly aware of it. Um, so that, again, is, is a good thing. No sé si... Hay aquí una pregunta, aquí hay alguna otra ya. Hello, it's an honor to be talking to you, Copano. I just wanted to ask, well, I read recently an article about a boy that discovered um, symptoms of skin cancer that were different in black people than in white uh, skin. Um, and he had always studied these symptoms in white skin in college or in school, and he wasn't able to see or to um, detect, uh, well, sorry. Detect. Uh, detect this um, cancer in black um, black people. So I wanted to ask about this racial bias that we can find in science. And if you see the hope of that changing, and how do you think you can do that? I, well, you work in medicine, so maybe you have an idea of what can uh, we do. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that's a brilliant example. I think, I, I think he actually ended up putting together a sort of dermatological guide on picking up um, skin cancer in, in black people. And it's brilliant. I mean, it's similar things with breast cancer. You know, often they used to say in South Africa, breast cancer is a disease of white women and mental health. You know, they used to be Africans don't get depressed, you know, sort of ridiculous notions like that. So um, you're absolutely right that there's lots of bias in, in terms of science, even facial recognition, you know, with cameras and that kind of thing, that they are biased towards detecting the scary black man as the criminal. Um, so I think representation matters. 
You know, I think like if we think about ourselves as women, you know, there are things that we are sensitive to that we don't even need to study. If we're sitting in a boardroom and the company doesn't offer maternity leave, we are immediately intuitively, you know, inclined to say, hey, wait a minute, this doesn't make any sense. Organizations are much more productive if they are supportive of their employees, if they encourage women to take maternity leave, both parents to take maternity leave. So I think it comes down to representation and enabling. You know, I think I, I, we all have our blind spots. I certainly can't speak for, you know, all sorts of diverse groups. I only know my, my worldview. But if I'm sitting in a boardroom where there's somebody from a different um, culture, religion, um, or sexual orientation or whatever, um, we are all better for it. So I think it's about representation and looking around, you know, sometimes if we're sit calling ourselves out, if we're sitting in a meeting or in a, in a book club, in a church, in a choir, um, in, a in, in a municipal committee, you know, we're, we're in a local committee um, and there's no one else that looks different to us, then that's a problem, right? Because we're probably not quite sensitive to all the nuances. Um, so I would say, you know, as ordinary citizens, making sure that we also engage with people who have different thoughts and views to us, that we're not afraid of the awkwardness that comes with sharing our views. I mean, like, you know, Xavier, as we were saying, the land one, you know, your friend that she can say that, she can talk about her fears and her vulnerabilities is important, right? Because that's when we are truly sort of making ourselves vulnerable um, and, and, and others are helping us to see our own blind spots. But as people with a little bit, you know, if you're someone who has a little bit more power and influence and can hire more diverse organizations, then that's exactly what we need to be doing. And I truly believe that whether we are, whatever, whatever our so-called disadvantage is, you know, whether it's that we're female or that we are disabled or that we are a minority race, I think, doing what we do with excellence encourages others. You know, for me, it wasn't that there was somebody who sat me down. I mean, I remember at medical school, there was a professor. He was one of the only few black academics. He was a, um, a cardiologist. And we had a long passage down the hospital, going from one end of the hospital to another. And he was one of the few that had the courage with his white coat and stethoscope to walk right down the middle. And many of us would kind of like shadows walk along the edges, you know? And I used to watch this black man with so much confidence and think, my goodness, when I finish, I want to be just like that. And he was brilliant. He published internationally. I mean, he's a household name in South Africa. He never necessarily said anything to me, but it was him in his excellence, doing his work with excellence that encouraged all of us who were first generation full-time university students to believe that it's possible. I, you know, our mothers and fathers didn't, you know, are not professionals necessarily. My parents happened to study afterwards to become professionals, but many black South Africans are first generation university students. And it just takes us in our roles, whether we are women or whether we are people with disability or whether we are foreigners in a country um, or a minority group, an ostracized group, to, to do our work with excellence. And I think that in of itself inspires others. I think we have time for a couple of questions, maybe. I have no idea where the micro is. is. Oh, they are deciding. Well, my, my question was more related to the, the topic that we were talking before about the land. It was because when I hear you, I was thinking about all the news that are arriving here that maybe are not that representative, but are the news that are arriving here. And it's about the farmer killing, the conflict about white farmers and black workers that sometimes ends with the killing of one of the farmers. And I wanted to hear your vision on that, if you think that is an isolated conflict or it seems to become a kind of a protest. Mm. Yeah, look, I mean, I think there's a lot of violence in South Africa. Um, I think violence just in townships or any communities really. Um, 
I think, so to, to I mean, any death is obviously tragic and um, violence is awful and shouldn't happen regardless of who's involved. And there certainly are issues with farm killings for sure. But I think South Africa is a country that struggles with violence, period, you know, and, and there's no group that's protected from that, whether they be white people, whether they be white farmers, whether they be white professionals, whether they be women. And so we do live in a society that struggles with violence. And I think sometimes that can be contorted or distorted to, to push a particular view in, in, in support of um, whatever political agenda. But I think on the main, you know, violence affects women, um, primarily in South Africa, it affects black women and children primarily. So if one wants to talk about who, who bears the brunt of violence, um, it's black women and that's the reality. So I think we need to get down to the core of why are we a violent society? And if you look at the work of economists globally, I'm not even talking about a South African bias, income inequality drives violent societies. You know, you see it even in big cities, um, even in the West, that the more there is, the, the wider the gap between the rich and the poor, the more um, violence and crime there is in a society. And we have the one of, I mean, it, you know, we're sort of vying for number one or number two, the, one of the highest Gini co coefficients, one of the highest economic markers of income inequality. So it should be no surprise that um, we struggle with crime and violence. And until we address that, it then be, it becomes, you know, people, you, groups, and I mean, any group can use pieces of that data to push a particular viewpoint. But at the end of the day, South Africa is a violent society and we need to address that. Yo, para afegir una mica, estic totalment d'acord amb el que diu la, la Copano. Um, és una societat violenta a Sudàfrica i això afecta també als, als grangers però eh, els grangers el que tenen és un altaveu molt gran, perquè estan connectats amb una part de la societat que té més capacitat econòmica i té més veu. En realitat, les, si mires les estadístiques, el 95% de les, de les actes violents passen a llocs pobres i la gran majoria entre gent que es coneix, fins i tot. Per tant, totes aquestes veus que parlen de genocidi blanc contra els eh, grangers, eh, això és una part que no és real. O sigui, és una societat violenta i té problemes amb, amb violència? Sí. És una societat molt desigual i això, com deia la Copano, provoca violència? Sí. I la situació que viuen els grangers en alguns casos doncs, està um, desprotegida davant d'això, perquè són granges que estan perdudes en uns territoris molt grans, rodejades de comunitats molt, molt pobres. Però deslligar això de la realitat del país i exagerar-la és on ens comencem a desviar de la veritat. A més, aquest problema de la violència contra els grangers, si la volguéssim dir, ha estat exagerada de manera eh, esbiaixada i, i, i dirigida per grups d'extrema dreta d'altres parts del món on es volia mm, posar més accent del compte en la violència negra contra els blancs, com si fos una guerra de races i no tant una qüestió de desigualtat i de problema de, de violència. Per tant, tot aqu... no és casual que hagi sentit tant a parlar, però no és innocent. O sigui, que hi hagi tanta informació sobre això, sobre això la meva opinió, no sé si la Copano eh, em, està d'acord amb mi, és, un, és voluntari perquè aquesta, aquest, eh, aquesta relació racial de la violència eh, estigui més exagerada del que és en, en realitat. I don't know if you want to add something. Yeah, I know, Zabi, I mean, I think you've, you've hit it spot on. Um, you know, we just have to keep the, the stats and the facts front and foremost, you know, as you rightly said, most violence is inter, interpersonal, it's inter, intimate partner violence, you know, as you said, pe people you know. Um, we know that, as I said in the beginning, that 20% of the population holds 70% of the economy. We know that much of the unemployment faces, uh, um, affects black people. So, 
you know, when you look at those big picture stats, it becomes difficult to try and understand what's behind a push of a particular narrative without, re whilst recognizing that any life lost in South Africa is tragic. Right, and we, and we should never minimize that. But if we look at the balance of South Africa's biggest challenges, that's certainly not number one. And as you say, you know, this notion that there's some kind of race war is a little bit misguided. Um, but yeah, I'm, I think we have a lot of work to do. And I think we, um, and we as a country need to um, protect ourselves, I think, protect each other from that kind of divisive misinformation, which is sometimes politically funded, you know. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not always innocent um, reporting. I think we have time for two questions, one on, on the public and one from the, sorry. much for the talk. Um, what I wanted to ask you about was about your writing. Um, I read an interview with you talking about coconut and you said this was you like trying to work out what it means to be a young black woman in South Africa and like who gets to decide that and I was wondering if that's still something you're working through in your writing and if you think the answer to that has changed since you wrote coconut. <laughs> um, sure that's a tough question. Um, I mean, I, I think coconut was fantastically, um, was a fantastic opportunity for me to grapple with all sorts of issues, which now have been named. And I think in our time, we didn't have the sort of, um, lexicon that we have now, you know, that some of the Black Lives Matters and, um, other movements have helped us, you know, giving us words to frame things. I think it was seeing and feeling these things, feeling like, why is it that, you know, speaking, a, speaking in a certain way, a very sort of Western way is considered smart or clever? Why is it that if I was to speak in my own vernacular language, people think I'm stupid? Why is it that if I have certain facial features or hair, etc.? So obviously, as a young person grappling through that, I think coconut was a for me, a gift um, to, to, to work through that. And I was completely blown away by the response, not just locally, but in other countries. And that actually this is not issues of identity or not, and, and that there is a particular type of beauty and um, yeah, that that's not necessarily unique to South Africa. Whether I still grapple with all those things now, um, I don't know, I mean, how much time do you have <laughs> for me to answer that question? I think one is always growing and evolving. And uh, um, I think sometimes, I mean, there's that saying that you, you write to know what you think. And I think sometimes you don't actually know what, I don't actually know what I think about something I still, I, until I start working through it through writing. And I think there's a beautiful sort of dance with what it means to the reader. Um, I think it's co-created sometimes. Um, and it's beautiful to hear the feedback and kind of hear how something that you didn't put too much mind to resonates with someone quite differently. Um, but yeah, I mean, I am quite self-indulgent with my, with my writing. It is a lot of my own therapy. <laughs> and um, yeah, I'm, I'm grateful that um, people can resonate with it. Last question. It's uh, something that it's... Very important here in Catalonia, where we are, because here in Catalonia, language uh, is very important. Catalan forms part of the, our culture. And this question says, a Sudáfrica hi ha 11 llengües oficials. Com una societat es pot unir si la majoria de la gent blanca no té cap interès en parlar les llengües més parlades del seu propi país? Yeah, look, I mean, that's a, that's a tough question. Um, yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think language is, is important. I think when you make an effort to at least learn a few words in, in someone's language, it, it shows that you care, that you don't think that you are superior, your language and culture and heritage is superior. And I think, of course, that's obviously the historical case in South Africa that sort of first English and then Afrikaans were for, you know, literally, I mean, it was mandatory. And that's partly why we had the 76 uprising was forcing people to, to speak those languages in the main. 
Um, so language remains a, um, an issue. And I think, as I said earlier, that our education system has made some attempts, but they certainly could be strengthened to truly um, celebrate and acknowledge and um, elevate the heritage cultures and languages of South Africa's very diverse and beautiful people. There's been some encouraging recent trends, you know, certain universities that have had PhDs published in, you know, I mean, we shouldn't even be calling them sort of native languages because this, these are languages spoken by the majority of people, but yet it remains a novelty when somebody achieves an academic achievement in those languages. Um, but I think what's inspired me is that, you know, shortly after following the Black Lives Matter sort of movement in the US, young, and I think I alluded to this earlier, young South Africans, when I say young, I'm talking about high school, were protesting in schools against a lack of representation, against a lack of recognition, against being, I mean, I remember being told in the 90s, you know, when I would speak to a friend in class in Sebedi or whatever, that don't speak that nonsense in the classroom. I mean, those were the words that were used. And, you know, this was early 90s where we were just so grateful to be accepted into schools that had previously been, um, you know, sort of ex basically for white South African children. And this is really the beginning of things cracking open. But seeing these young 15, 16 year olds saying absolute nonsense, we are not having this. And um, protesting and, um, you know, really just making their voices, it is, is inspiring. Because honestly, I think there was a, our generation and, and maybe it was just my little world where there was a lot of, um, yeah, just, seeking assimilation, right? And it was kind of, there's this um, gold standard of whiteness and, you know, let's work hard to get there. Whereas this generation is saying absolute nonsense. You know, we, we are all important. All our languages are important. All of our cultures are important. And we, we demand to be seen and heard. And that inspires me. I mean, Xavier, when you ask about subsequent generations, I think this, this, this youth that is coming up is um, articulate and courageous and they, they're not afraid to speak truth to power. And I think it's challenging South Africa in a very healthy way, because I think we, we were lulled a little bit by the, um, the sort of romance of the so-called rainbow nation. And the cracks in the rainbow are, are very apparent. And I think this generation is not afraid to deal with them. Mm -hmm. well, una, como anécdota, uh, de la importancia de las lenguas um, para apropiarse a los pueblos, para unir Pobles, el tenim el Nelson Mandela quan va estar a Robben Island um, tancat durant 27 anys. Una de les primeres coses que va fer va ser aprendre la llengua de l'enemic, en aquest cas l'afrikaner, um, que um, ell deia que era una manera de... També va estudiar la seva història. Era una manera de, en lloc de parlar-los al cervell, al cap, parlant la seva llengua, podria parlar-los al, al cor. I per Nelson Mandela um, la llengua era una de les qüestions importants per unir Al, al país. Well, we have to finish here. It has been a, a pleasure. Um, I remember the first uh, interview that I read uh, about you. It was like maybe 2005, 2007. You were a young, young uh, girl. And the, the journalist asked you what, what you want to be in the future. And you say, I want to be a doctor and I want to be a writer. So congratulations for that. <laughs> and when you were talking about this teacher, this black teacher in, in the medicine school that was encouraging you to believe that is possible, that was possible, I could say the same to you. You are a black young girl that showed that it was possible to be a doctor, to be a writer, and also to be a, a mother. So thank you very much for your work. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity. Gracias. Don Res, muchas gracias por venir. Espero que hagueu gaudit de la, de la conversa de Copano y res més. Muchas gracias por venir avui.